Okay, we're going to start. I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is Cindy Parham, the chair of the Public Health and Safety Committee of the RTM of Fairfield. First, I'd like to introduce my committee that is presently on or trying to get on, and that would be uh, Vice Chair Bill Perigini, Secretary Laura Carson, and members Elizabeth Altabelli, Matt Ambrose, Will Diaz, Veronica Monahan, and Amy Ruggiero. We also are joined by, I believe, Chief Calamares, Captain Broderick, Captain Tercy, as well as Lieutenant Koval. Um, maybe you could, you know, make, if I'm wrong about that attendance list, if you could change that now. Oh, that's absolutely right. Yep. Absolutely right. Okay. And of course, Bill Hurley, a town engineer who is instrumental in many of our traffic patterns and infrastructure in the town of Fairfield. If anyone that's not planning to speak right now could just mute their phone as there is some background noise. Um, if we would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So the Public Health and Safety RTM Committee, comprised of eight of us from many districts around town, wanted to make sure that we told the Fairfield PD, especially the traffic division, that we are here as a liaison to the town board and to the rest of our constituents. We felt that this good exchange of information would be a great way to start the conversation, especially with the pandemic coming to a close, we hope soon, and the reopening of downtown and many different intersections and how they'd be impacted. We realized that many restaurants, bars with later curfews, as well as theaters opening and many entertainment facets downtown are gonna affect traffic patterns. We also, at the end of the agenda, are gonna highlight some specific intersections that our committee has deemed as important to at least look at, and I'm sure they have been looked at, but we'd like to know more about how the enforcement and the education is continuing in these specific intersections. So that's the reason for the meeting, and I would like to ask if any of the members of the police department could also just give us a brief overview of strategies and plans and Maybe just an introduction and like where we could be of help and where you can be of help to us as we explain the different changes that will come about in the coming months. So thank you for just spending a few minutes on that, if you would. Good morning, everybody. First of all, thank you for uh, thank you for having it. it. It came off quicker. Did we just leave it? Um, thank you for having us. Uh, here this morning, our camera's not working. It's not. It it's okay. We can see you well. It's fine. I'm Bob Calamaris, the chief of police, uh, and here we have Captain Chris Terzi, Captain Keith Broderick, and Pete Koval. Um, you know, as I said in uh, multiple mediums when uh, I took this job, that one of my primary concerns were going to be uh, traffic safety, um, and and. Personally, throughout my career, I've worked not only in the traffic safety unit, but uh, have worked as a supervisor and then a, uh, in a leadership role also in the traffic safety unit. So um, currently, uh, Lieutenant Koval and Captain Chris Terzi are in charge of that unit. And um, I could say that, um, you know, we have a unique community with a, with, uh, in a sense that we have um, I-95, the Merritt Parkway, and uh, the Post Road. And what happens is uh, our residential streets, our residential neighborhoods, uh, when these major arteries get backed up, uh, these you know people commuting to and from work uh, historically infiltrate these neighborhoods and use these side roads, especially if, if you're local, to, um, to uh, commute to work. Um, so... Um, looking at uh, going forward, I, I can say that uh, for the 21 years that I've been here, uh, traffic safety has been uh, the biggest issue uh, that we've that we have faced, and I think we've taken uh, some pretty pretty heavy strides uh, as our department has evolved with the current times. Um, with that said. 
Um, COVID has presented quite a few challenges uh, for us, not only as police officers, but um, it presents uh, some challenges with how we interact with the public on traffic stops. Um, a huge component of traffic stops are related to enforcement. And um, when I say enforcement, that doesn't necessarily mean a ticket. That could just mean a traffic stop with a verbal warning. It is a level of enforcement. And um, uh, we do that on a daily basis. Um, I can say that there were a few months uh, during the, the pandemic that um, we pretty much ceased uh, almost completely uh, traffic enforcement and um, that had a significant effect. I think that was pretty much statewide based on uh, what the Fairfield County Chiefs and the uh, Connecticut, uh, Connecticut Chiefs of Police Association, um, I think, you know, and I think all of us just as members of the community uh, have seen uh, the, as a result of the pandemic, the increase in uh, the lack of traffic safety that some people have uh, just because the roads are a little more open. There's a lot less traffic. And uh, what that has done is that has impacted our, um, now we have more pedestrian and cyclists in the roadway or users as the, of the roadway. And uh, that has impacted uh, that quite significantly. Um, I will pass it over to uh, Pete Koval, who will talk about some of the strategies that we use um, in our traffic unit uh, directly so that, um, you know, and I guess what's important to talk about is how would a, uh, a resident of the town of Fairfield um, if they live on 123 Main Street, how would they contact the police department to initiate the uh, police department to start looking at their road? Um, and I'll let uh, Lieutenant Koval talk about that a little bit. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Lieutenant Pete Koval of the uh, Traffic and Special of the Special Services Division. Uh, the first thing citizens can do when they have a problem in their area is a citizen service request. Um, it's a online tool that uh, citizens can use to um, to put in a request for a, a problem, either with a sign, uh, a traffic sign, a traffic problem in their area, whether it's speeding, um, a stop sign, whatever the issue may be. Uh, we at the police department see those. Uh, service requests and we take action on the ones that we can. Um, it could be a target area in town where we um, we can set up alerts um, or we share those service requests with uh, the traffic unit. We um, have to go out and target those areas, whether for um, have visibility in the area to enforce violations in the area. Um, that's one of the many things that our traffic unit does on a daily basis. Um, they work all hours of the day, morning and evening. Um, not just the traffic unit, but um, the patrol division also uh, will know about the target areas. Um, everything we have is shared electronically. So uh, that's one of the things we can do to hit the hot spots in town. We know that there's been an obviously, as Chief Kalmar said, there's been an increase in pedestrian um, and cyclists in town. Also, in the uh, in around the schools, there's been a huge increase um, of, of of parents and children walking to school, uh, with a lot less children taking the bus now. There's been an increase in uh, uh, tr vehicle traffic in the school areas, with uh, longer lines to get into the schools, causing traffic problems on some of the side roads in town where the schools are. So those, that's some of the issues we're dealing with now. Um, right now, we actually have our traffic unit targeting uh, the area around McKinley School based on a re uh, request that we had with the traffic backed up in cars using Lennox Road as a cut through. So we have, um, that's one example of what we do. We send the traffic unit out to Lennox Road and that area around the school to try to enforce uh, safety issue of traffic safety in that area. Um, so that's some of the things we do as a traffic unit um, and as a patrol division also help assist us with that, uh, with our goal of uh, making uh, traffic people drive safer in the area. Um, that, that kind of leads us to the next, I don't want to interrupt your talk there. However, the pedestrian and bicyclists, since you did bring it up about 
um, more people with bikes um, and walkers. And of course, even one of our committee members mentioned to us at the last meeting that sometimes we don't know where to walk. So we're walking on one side of the road with our dog, our neighbor might be on the other side, keeping their distance. And then a third person comes and we're walking in the middle of the road to stay safe. So we want to spend time on section four, this four of the agenda, which is what are the rules of the road? How can we assist the community in enforcing these? We have specific um, areas that we feel like this has been a, an issue, especially one intersection that comes up with all of our committee members is the um, post road and Uncoa road, taking a right onto the post road and who's got the right of way, are bikes able to use the sidewalk? Do we walk and bike against traffic or with traffic? So if you could just maybe summarize that a little bit for us. And then of course, I'd like my committee to please chime in regarding this as well, whenever you feel you'd like to. Got it. Hi Cindy, Keith Broderick. Uh, I'll touch on this, probably one of our most challenging uh, topics. Because a, a speeder go through stop sign, very easy and force, here's your, here's your ticket. Can you imagine ticketing um, three ladies out for a walk on Pequot Ave for reckless use of the highway by, by a pedestrian? Will not go over well, and we'll be on Q alert to Brenda's office that um, probably took enforcement as, a, action we should. So they're required to use the sidewalk where sidewalks are provided. So Pequot Ave to the thousand block has a sidewalk, but it's only about two and a half feet wide. Then you hit the thousand block, and there's no sidewalk, so it pushes people to the road. Uh, so. It doesn't say what side of the road. Some people are under the impression that you have to work, walk against traffic. That's more safety. I want to see what's coming at me. Um, so the, the law doesn't dictate what side of the road to walk on. It's what you're safe with. And then with social distancing, you see everybody kind of leapfrogging across the roads to stay away from people. Churchill Beach Road's a big one as well. People are all over. Bikes are going around. It's like Frogger going down the west end of Churchill Beach Road. Um, so very challenging. So like, let's go Churchill Beach Road even. East of the sea grape, there's sidewalks. So you're supposed to be using sidewalks there. Very few people do, um, for whatever reason, strollers with driveways, bikes with curbs. Um, so most people kick out the road and then it becomes a slalom course. So we're hesitant for arresting people for reckless use of the highway for enjoying a, a sunny Saturday afternoon on Pequot or Fairfield Beach Road. Um, maybe a little different when there's college kids walking down the yellow line with a cup at two in the morning screaming, they might get a reckless use of the highway pedestrian ticket because it's a different use. You know, they're, they're, they're out there creating mayhem versus somebody going for a walk. Um, bikes, bikes are required to go with the flow of traffic. If uh, you haven't chosen, so if they use the sidewalk, then they're required to stop at every intersection. Um, and as a pedestrian, they wait to cross the road. So it's a, it's a hodgepodge of um, location, depending on locations, sidewalks, no sidewalks. Crosswalks they have pedestrians have the right of way, but they have to wait. They can't just jump out on the road. There's a green light. They have to wait. They can't just jump on the road. Um, so I'd, I'd like to touch on two of those uh, points. Um, some some of the some communities in the state of Connecticut have a uh, no bicycles on the sidewalk sidewalk ordinance. Um, Fairfield does not. So uh, sidewalk cycling is permitted. Um, not necessarily encouraged because if you were pulling out of a driveway, let's say at the brick walk, um, you would not expect a bicycle traveling at, uh, you know, 15 or 20 miles an hour to come off on the sidewalk. You would expect that vehicle or that traffic unit, which is what we refer to it as to be in the roadway. Um, the, uh, it, you know, it, it's assumed that uh, sidewalks are for pedestrians. And, and that's what a drivers or driver behavior is expecting. Um, with that said, we do not have an ordinance. Uh, the second thing is we are a yield state when it refers to uh, pedestrians. We are not a stop state. So um, some states you are required to stop when you see a pedestrian uh, in or near a crosswalk. The state of Connecticut, you don't have to stop until they enter into the crosswalk. Uh, you have to yield to the pedestrian entering the crosswalk. Um, so Connecticut is a yield state as it refers to uh, pedestrians in a crosswalk. Um, what we have found, and it kind of goes into the um, kind of a good segue into the recent accidents that have occurred down in the beach area, um, three, are, three of which are uh, pedestrian accidents. 
And two of those, and most commonly from our experience in the traffic unit and accident reconstruction, um, most commonly, whenever we have a pedestrian struck, it is, and we hate to put it on the victim, but it is the pedestrian's fault. Um, and it's for a multitude of reasons. Most of the time, um, they're not following the rules of traffic. We consider um, anyone, any user of the roadway to be a traffic unit, whether it's a pedestrian, a bicyclist, a motorcyclist, or a vehicle, um, and they all have to follow the rules of the road. Um, in two of those three cases down at the beach, um, for example, the woman on Old Post Road, she was in the right of way. She was already established in the crosswalk. The uh, the driver of the vehicle did not um, yield to her being in the crosswalk, and she was struck. Um, the two others were uh, running across mid block, and without the um, so the, the basically the state law says that you have to cross within the lateral extensions of the curb line at an intersection. For example, if you were walking mid block, you'd have to find the next intersection and walk within the lateral extensions of the, the curb line. Um, some residential areas, it's not too conducive to that. Um, but in our area, in our beach area, you know, you might have to walk uh, an extra an extra couple of feet just to get to the next intersection. Um, I hope that answers some of your questions that relate to that. I think Bill Pergini has some input with the beach area, don't you, Bill? Yeah, I'd love to jump in and thank you, gentlemen, for joining us and about a month on the job for you, Chief Calinaris, and I'm sure it's as much fun as you anticipated it would be before joining. But, but, <laughs> thank uh, you, Bill. But great, great insights. I mean, I could tell you from 10 p.m. to 3 o'clock in the morning on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it's all bets are off on Fairfield Beach Road. And I'm not sure how many violations are given, but it's a zoo down there. And so fortunately, there's not lots of traffic, but there are gangs, 20, 30, 40 students intoxicated, and there's zero regard for the roadway as a, as a passageway for vehicles. But that's a that's a whole nother ball of wax. And as mentioned by Captain Broderick, you know, what exacerbates that issue is there are no sidewalks at all in Fairfield Beach Road. So, you know, how do these poor students get home? And I can tell you that at 11, 12, 1 a.m., 3 p.m. after, you know, maybe six drinks or 12 drinks deep in the count from the sea grape, they are not walking single file and they don't really care about, you know, two ton vehicles uh, passing them by. Um, but yeah, so, you know, lo lots of issues. And as we all know, you know, many of these pedestrians, you know, uh, and again, they, they, they're, they're, they're obviously victims and, you know, we hate to have them point the thumb. They always want to point the finger, but you're absolutely right. Nobody, nobody walks to the nearest intersection to cross and, you know, reef road is, notoriously challenging with all the parked cars there. Um, I guess the question that I would have is, you know, how do we solve it? So these, you know, we've, we've defined the problems and we understand, you know, the steps to bring citizens aware, but there are so many areas and so many intersections that um, it just, it's not getting better. And, and, you know, there are flagrant violations on behalf of pedestrians and certainly flagrant violations on behalf of the motorists, but how do we fix it? And you, I'm sure you gentlemen are aware of, you know, the, the many vocal residents who have advocated for speed bumps and speed tables on Fairfield Beach Road, on South Benson Road, and for several reasons, um, you know, that is not a viable option. But what other strategies or tactics can be employed to, to move the needle? And we're not going to fix every problem, but if we could address 25% of the problems, I think it's a success. So how could, how could we do that? Do you gentlemen have any thoughts on any specific strategies or tactics that we could put in play you know, before people start becoming more active outdoors to really tackle some of these issues? Well, I, I will say that uh, whenever we go to a residential area, let's say Reef Road, for example, we find, and, and, and Bill, you know that we've been on, on Fairfield Beach Road, heavy presence on Fairfield Beach Road as it relates to traffic. And we find that, um, 95% of the violators are the people who live there. The same people that are complaining are the same people that live there, but the rules don't apply to them. And we find that to be uh, probably one of the most significant um, observations when we're down there. And, and then the question is, you know, oh, well, it's five in the morning. I don't have to, I don't have to drive the speed limit because nobody's on the road, but that's, that's not the case. You know, there are joggers, there are people exercising, riding bikes um, that early in the morning and, and throughout the day. But 
Um, I'll give you an example. We had a lot of complaints up on uh, Churchill Road uh, a few years back, and um, th they came in before the commission and they said, you know, help us come out, come down here. We want everyone to get a ticket. Uh, one month later, we, we went down there and we did a strict enforcement program. And one month later, they came back before the police commission and they said, please leave. We don't want you here anymore. <laughs> So, and and I say that with a sidebar of a joke, but at the same time, um, it's it's uh, our the observations that we have when we are on specific traffic enforcement details are it is the people who live in that neighborhood who are complaining, um, and then and then you know we try a a big education push to say like. You know, we have those e signs that we put all over town. We move them around. It's a it's a huge resource draw to move those signs around and put them in different areas and set them to, uh, you know, to coordinate with with that specific roadway. Okay. And, um, you know, we're police officers. We're not traffic sign movers. But if the traffic sign, if, if putting the traffic sign in that place assists in reducing uh, traffic violations without having to strictly enforce and give interactions, then uh, we'll do it because we want to be partners with the community. We don't want to be enforcers of the community. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Case in point, that woman that was struck on Old Post Road was hit by a resident of Fairfield Beach Road, as you well know. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, com I, com I completely agree. Um, you know, I, I guess it's it's challenging because those who are most most vocal about complaining are often the ones that are the the reasons behind the problems. And I know case in point, when I leave for the airport, it's five o'clock in the morning. I mean, just blatant, just blowing through stop signs right before the police station. And, you know, even all the way up reef to Old Post Road, people have absolutely zero regard. And it's not just in that part of Fairfield or this part of the state. It's all over. It's all over. I, almost, I was almost hit in Washington, D.C., right in front of the FBI headquarters about five years ago. Absolute disregard. Car just blew right through a red light. Um, and, and so, you know, I just think people are, are just, they've just got no regard for the law. And certainly, and, and I think you folks have seen this with the pandemic, since there's less vehicles on the street, it seems to um, lead to more speeding because there's less traffic. And I think, you know, more densely or more dense traffic patterns actually help slow um, the, the velocity of, of vehicles. So, I, you know, I don't know what the answer is. Um, and I agree, those people who are most vocal are often the ones responsible for the problem. But I, I just think we've got a devastating situation on our hands and we need to figure out how to tackle it. What the answers are, I, I don't know. I'm not a traffic enforcement professional. Um, and that's what we were hoping you gentlemen would help, help us solve. If the police would like to um, just give some feedback for a couple of minutes on that, and then Will Diaz has some input as well. Hi all, Chris Darcy. Um head to traffic enforcement under with Pete Koval. Um, just a couple ideas, uh, just to back up real set quick on what you said. During the pandemic, we absolutely across the state saw speeds increase because of the lack of traffic on the roads. And you know as well as uh, I do, as we do, we're creatures of habit, we're muscle memory. Once those speeds increase, just because traffic increases, people are accustomed to now using those speeds. So that's something that has naturally occurred over the past year, year and a half. So it's simply getting the habits back and dropping the speeds back down. Um, to give you an idea of what we do when we get a complaint through Q Alert, um, and I don't mean a complaint where somebody calls in and says, "Hey, my neighbor who drives this red Honda license one two three ABC is recklessly driving." We obviously deal with that, but as a general rule, someone says, "Hey, we're having problems on Wilson Street." So what our protocols are is we we do a, a series of events. So the first thing we'll do is put out something called a black box, which registers our speed and our volume and gets all our data. Gives you the average speed east and west or north and south and gives you the total volume of the street. We generally keep that up for seven to 14 days. Um, and what we wanna do is make sure we get a good cross braid of weekends, weekday, commuter. Because one of the arguments we've had in the past when the police commission comes out is, well, you, you went on a day where school was out, kids were out of school, or you went on a day where it was Christmas vacation. So what we want to do is keep that up so we get a true feel for the roadway. 
once we get that data, uh, the next thing we do is put the electronic speed signs out with the chief touched on. Uh, it is cumbersome, but they are effective. They are very effective for a short period of time. People get accustomed to them. So when you put them up for seven to 14, maybe even 21 days, we have we, statistics have shown that our numbers drop. However, after 14 days, when they realize it's not a radar gun that they're getting a ticket sent to their home for, it's not effective anymore. So we have to rotate that. And again, with 270 miles of roadway and what be like a, a shopping list of requests for these with a limited number of them, we have to constantly rotate where they go. The, the next part of it is engineering where Bill has been an amazing asset. Um, we'll look at some of the streets. Is there a way where we can bring some of the lines in? So um, on the right and left sides, when the lines come in, your eyes naturally narrow the road and studies have shown that that naturally reduces the speed, uh, along with a number of grants that, again, Bill's been really, really effective in helping us out with. And then the last part of that was we sent our officers out and start issuing warnings or tickets to whatnot. Uh, and the chief has touched on that. Depending on the area, not so much in our arteries, but in our residential streets, I, I can't give you a number, but I, my guess would be about 75% uh, are the local residents that live there. So just to give you, I just wanted to give you a rundown on what the protocol is. So I mentioned, you mentioned, how do we fix this? That's just kind of what our design is when we receive a complaint. Turn it over. Perfect. To Thank you, Captain Tercy. If I'm not interrupting, I'd like to have Will Diaz, our newest member of the Public Health and Safety Committee. He had some comments. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, thanks for taking the time out. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll be in uh, District 5. Uh, I live over on Melville Avenue, uh, corner of Nordstrom. Um, as you guys know, the, we've had a pretty snowy winter. Um, that is, is uh, I'm seeing everywhere I go around town, uh, there's areas where, where folks haven't sort of shoveled their sidewalks and such. So I'm seeing a lot of folks walking out in the middle of the road, kids, dogs. Um, I'm not sure uh, if, if we've had any incidents, but uh, it's, it looks like a problem waiting to happen. I'm very hesitant to, to suggest, um, you know, ticketing homeowners. Uh, however, uh, it's, it just seems to be a problem uh, that, that, that I, you know, I'm seeing very often. Um, the other part is uh, over where I live. There's there's this crosswalk at uh, it's on Villa Avenue on the corner of Melville, and there's a stop sign on either way. And these are folks going in and out of Bridgeport. Um, uh, but I feel like I'm taking playing chicken every time I go and cross that that crosswalk, uh, and I see it pretty often. Some of the joggers that are going across, uh, folks just aren't stopping at that stop sign. Uh, usually the one going toward uh, Bridgeport on Villa Avenue. And uh, it just, it's, again, it looks like, uh, again, I don't know if there's any, been any incidents recently there. Uh, however, I've seen with my own eyes at least uh, probably five or six times where a car has sort of stopped right, right in front of a, a pedestrian, um, almost hitting them uh, in the last, you know, month. So, uh, I wonder if there's there's been any um, complaints lodged about that specific area, and then you know what are we doing about the snow issue? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, address the first one, then I'll pass along the second part of your question. Um, the first one, there is a protocol in place. We do have a town ordinance that you have to shovel your your. I believe it's within 24 hours after the storm. Uh, the sidewalk, excuse me. Um, so the what you can do is you can call dispatch, our, our non-emergency number. Or simply enter it into the town's Q alert, the town's alerting system. Citizen service um, request is that that's a citizen name. service that's request nickname. that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, the nickname is Q alert. Um, the town hall has assigned a specific person to that, and the way the protocol is is they will go out, they'll evaluate it, they'll try to make contact with the homeowner uh, and let them know that the town ordinance is there. Begin to um, if at that. Excuse me, I got to go. I'm sorry, guys. If at that point um, they do not. Um, adhere to the enforcement. I'm sorry, adhere to clearing their sidewalk. The police department is now contacted and then we have an enforcement ability. We can go out and give out a hundred dollar ticket um, and then order them uh, to block. So yeah, please, we, we have not received a lot of calls this year. In the past we have. 
to address your question about um, has it occurred any incidents occurred with that? Not this year. We have had one in the past few years. I, I don't want to give you the wrong exact year it was. I think it was 2018. Uh, it was on Mill Plain at Uncoa, where the person did not. Um, he was an elderly person. They did not have the sidewalk shoveled at the the intersection, the T intersection. The children decided to wait because they had no choice to cross with the crossing guard. But they had to walk into the roadway and fortunately wasn't injured hard, but he, he was struck by a car 100% due to the fact that the snow was was there. Now, what happens in those circumstances? Do they, you know, is it, is it, there yeah. is, does a, the homeowner bear any responsibility in that situation or? I gotta go, I'm sorry. Um, for civil responsibility, yes, they are absolutely, we're limited um, in what we can do as far as have to determine whether it was a pedestrian struck or if it was a, uh, I'm sorry, if the pedestrian was at fault or the driver was at fault in that particular accident. But we also then enforce the town ordinance on the uh, the homeowner, and they're they're in a lot of trouble civilly. They, I would, I'm assuming they were civilly sued for that. Um, mm -hmm. Phil, can you chime in on that at all? I'll be carried. Bill Hurley, can you chime in on that? Let me, oh, can you hear me? I was yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, I agree with everything you uh, said, uh, Captain. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the examples uh, that uh, I had used uh, recently, um, we had our uh, sidewalk enforcer or inspector go uh, near McKinley School, and uh, three times uh, either he or I knocked on the uh, door and no one ever answered. Uh, but then I saw uh, they were selling a car outside. They had a phone number. So I was able to uh, contact them that way. And um, so um, they uh, they were, um, I just, as a matter of fact, I just did that yesterday. So we're expecting them to clear the sidewalk. And there's one of those cases where now that they've notified, they've received the call, uh, you know, we have no problem finding them if we had to, you know. You know, the old lady or old man, or any of our seniors or handicapped, you know, people, people who are in Florida, you know, you kind of look for clues too. If they don't have any of their steps shoveled or their driveway shoveled, you know, maybe there's a little bit of sympathy or a reason for that. But when you see their own driveways or their own steps and, and walkway shoveled, but not the sidewalk, then to me, that's either uh, that, that's a laziness or a little bit of ignorance. And so, um, you know, uh, um, many of the tools that we have is the education, and I believe on uh, Brenda's um, uh, weekly updates, I think there's a whole section on, uh, side, you know, being responsible to remove the snow from the sidewalk. But again, that doesn't reach everybody. So uh, I think the best way, the best or the most neighborly approach would probably be to, if you know the people, to just remind them. And sometimes hearing it from them, you know, your own neighbors might might have a better impact, but certainly as the captain and the chief alluded to, the uh, uh, citizen request form uh, would be the, the next way to go. And uh, we will follow through on, on those complaints. Okay, um, great. Thank you, Captain Cersei and Bill Hurley. Does anyone have anything else before we move to social media plans regarding crosswalks, snow removal or anything of that nature before we move on to section six. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention uh, again real quick on the uh, Villa Avenue in Melville as an example. Uh, certain things that we would look at, uh, we I wasn't aware of that intersection. I mean, a couple of years ago, uh, there was maybe a complaint and I think we repainted the lines or something like that. But that's one of the things we do. We do a site investigation, DPW engineering or the police, or maybe we all do it together. Uh, and you look for a fresh pavement markings, uh, maybe a reflective signpost is the sign. Can you see it at night or is it now, maybe if it's 15 years old, it's faded, you know, uh, maybe we'd put a new one, a new sign up. Uh, and then you can even go with a bigger sign if there's a, a significant uh, issue, you know, maybe the signs are too small or maybe even put a stop ahead sign, kind of a warning sign to let people. So that's one of the things uh, based on this call even, uh, Will, that uh, you know I'll go out there the next time and, and, and take a look at those and see if there's some relatively low hanging fruit, low cost measures that could certainly improve the situation. Appreciate it, Phil, thank you. Okay, moving on to social media. Oh, go ahead, is Veronica on the call? Yeah. yeah. 
So, Veronica Monahan would like to speak. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, you know, the, the exit ramp on I-95 near Carrollton, I know there was an accident there recently. Um, is anything being done there to kind of, I mean, was that the pedestrian's fault? Was that the driver's fault? Is there anything that can be done at that intersection? I feel as though with schools opening, the train station, the number of walkers in and out of town, et cetera, that, you know, even my daughter will say to me, mom, that's the scariest intersection to cross in town. But what can we do there to make people feel a little more comfortable walking across the street? Veronica, you're talking specifically about the I-95 ramp over by Carrollton? Yes. Yeah, and Mill, Mill Plain, right, Veronica? Yeah. Just to be clear, yeah. um, is, was that at the four-way stop or is it on the other side, of, uh, south of the, the uh, turnpike? Where the exit, the exit and entrance is closer to Carrollton. So that, uh, okay, that's the four-way stop. Pedestrians, a lot of the healthcare providers work. They're you know coming back and forth and picking up the bus on the post road. So there's a lot of pedestrian pedestrian traffic. And you know, like many other parts of town, there's just you know flagrant violators either entering the ramp or coming off the ramp or doing six different things at once. Um, so people it's, creeping it's, into Mill Plain Road. Well, I, I can touch on the Mill Plain Road one. That that was actually a state police accident. It happened on the ramp. Um, I don't know the specifics of the accident, but uh, it, it's my understanding that it was called in later and investigated by the state police. Yeah, we were, we were never called to scene. Our, EM, our EMS went, but not our police. No, no police response to that accident. And I witnessed it, and I know there was a gentleman who was hit, um, and I was driving by, and I just, you know, I look at the entrance and exit to the train station, and with the markings in the road and whatnot, and there's a clear delineation in terms of where you're supposed to walk across the street and where you're not. And then you pass the, you know, the entrance and exit to 95, you know, again, closer to Carrollton, which is very highly trafficked. And the road, the sidewalk, everything there just seems a little bit more of an afterthought when it comes to pedestrian safety. We, we, can, look, we can look into that. Um, they, um... I think I uh, just uh, for about uh, maybe two months ago, I was able to obtain a a, a little uh, traffic uh, reporter uh, suggestion um, summary uh, for um, uh, crosswalks uh, near highway ramps. So uh, I'll, I'll take a look at that and and see if there's any of those measures that they list that we could maybe address. And then anything that we do, because it, if it does involve the highway ramp, we will have to work with the Connecticut DOT because uh, um, they're, they're responsible for the highway ramps. Uh, but certainly that's that's another one uh, that we can you know take a look at and see if there's any suggestions. I think if I recall, uh, there's a very long crosswalk that goes across both of those ramps. I, I think there's a small median in the middle, but if not, that might be another thing that we could possibly uh, to do to um, uh, make it a little bit safer. And again, we'll look at the signs, reflective pavement markings, uh, maybe some warning signs if it's possible, um, and go from there. The only thing we can't do, though, is usually with a stop sign, you normally don't put a crosswalk, you know, but, uh, those are uh, the crosswalk signs or symbols. Those are usually only for mid-block crosswalks and not for the stop control. But uh, we have a whole list of uh, uh, items in our quote toolbox that that the police and the engineering can work with. So we'll take a look at that. That's perfect. So now we've touched upon five of the bullets in point nine. So we're going to go back to the last five and nine at the end of the meeting. But now I'd like to just quickly go over. Um, Captain Broderick had shared with me some excellent social media that was happening during the holiday that the police department had put on Instagram. Um, regarding texting, seatbelts, being safe, driving slow. And I'm wondering what the social media plans are for the PD. We, many of us have mentioned children and crosswalks and how we're concerned for their safety. Many children are on Instagram, they're on different social media. And I'm wondering what the plans are to make sure we educate the younger community up through the college age students in this regard. I'm not exactly sure what they have in the shoot going out. Chief Cal Morris could probably speak better to it because we have Mike Stahl. We have actually a whole social media team that pushes us everything on Instagram, Facebook, 
and I see I don't have Instagram, but I have Facebook, and there's message after message daily going out. And he could probably speak a little better to um, not not the plan, but how how they push things out through social media through our public affairs office. Yeah, so so uh, every it, it will end up being as as the it's weather based. So as the weather gets nicer and there's a higher propensity of cyclists and and pedestrians going out there. Um, we try to bring awareness to motorists and awareness to those, and we just kind of try to put out uh, little bits of information that people can grab onto, and it's something that jogs their memory that, hey, it's a nice day out there, it's 65 degrees and sunny, and people aren't used to it, so uh, let's, let's, uh, let's keep it in the forefront of our minds when we're driving. Um, and those go out every couple of days, and we try to make it weather-related, just like when there's uh, snow-related events, uh, upcoming, we try to put out uh, snow related uh, information that goes out. Perfect. I know a lot of the children in the past have gotten gift certificates to Sunny Days, Dairy Queen, Saga Tuck Sweets for following traffic rules and wearing a helmet. And maybe, maybe even like not walking and texting at the same time might be another good idea. But um, are there any plans at all for reinstituting or continuing with those types of programs to encourage our youth? Yeah, those those plans are still in effect. We also do a uh, bicycle rodeo, which used to bring uh, nearly 200 kids, uh, and we would do that down at Jennings Beach in the beginning of the spring season, and just to try to. Uh, encourage kids for bicycle use. We cooperated with, uh, uh, collaborated with um, Yale New Haven Health that provides uh, hundreds of helmets for us to hand out to uh, to school age kids and parents if they want one. But uh, we, we um, it normally brings a pretty big uh, following uh, because of COVID. I don't know how that's going to go this year, but we're surely going to try to make an effort to uh, to get that message out and. Or maybe we'll just do on a case by case basis and offer it out there that we have X amount of helmets first come first serve come to the PD and we'll uh, you know we'll hand out a pamphlet with a helmet and and give them some rules of the road for that. And now, Chief Calvaris, who do those helmets come from primarily? Yale New Haven Health. We have a partnership with them for um, bicycle safety, pedestrian safety, and also uh, car seat safety. So we have a, a car seat program where we can um, either check the car seat that you're in, you installed, or we can we have um, trained car seat installation uh, officers that are, and all joking aside, it is a 40 hour course. It's eight hours a day for a week where officers have to uh, take this course and um, get certified to install a car seat. So uh, we offer that to not only our community, but anyone who comes in to have a, a whether it's an infant car seat or a toddler car seat. And we, we try to teach them uh, the intricacies of all those uh, different types of seats. And then uh, at the same time, teach them how to install the car seat so that they can do it on their own. Great. And how many of our police officers are trained with that certificate? Uh, we have, I would say, an estimate of at least 12 at this time. That's perfect. Wonderful. I'm going to skip over section seven, which was the strategies and short term and long term goals and go right to one of the points that our entire committee will probably have some input. And that is with the downtown reopening post COVID, um, things like restaurants with longer um, curfews, um, hundreds of cars, possibly in the train station parking lot because FTC may be open the same time the Sacred Heart Community Theater is open with all the restaurants surrounding. Um, I know Veronica had some questions about that, possibly closing off areas. Is there a parking garage on the horizon? Um, are there any plans for closing um, parts of the road down during special events if the theater and FTC have an event the same night? I did hear that when the community Sacred Heart Theater was opening originally, they had a plan of over 50 events throughout the year, either Sacred Heart sponsored events or things that they would be having other groups do in at their site. So what are the realities about enforcement of traffic right now, um, planning for the reopening of the downtown post COVID, especially those items I mentioned? Um, you want to, to touch a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, I know you referenced, you know, uh, closing down parking spots and closing roads. 
I'm kind of frowned upon because for everybody benefits of a closing road, somebody opposes it. And the business, uh, whether it's a flow of traffic to another area of town or they can't get to the pizza parlor because they're trying to go to get captains and they can't get down Sanford Street. So we're really not, not very fond of closing down roads, especially in the business district because it negatively affects somebody else. The parking spots we were talking about before our meeting, um, they're, they're, they're needed. They're needed for the other businesses. So you really can't shut down parking spots and have pedestrians flow out of the post road. Um, I don't think we're going to have the you know, hundreds of thousands or however many people crowds that, that maybe you're, you're envisioning post COVID um, like a fireworks detail um, where there's just people all over the place. So they're going to have to, the, 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 the sidewalks are plentiful down there. There's, there's some parking. If we get down all the parking downtown, they're going to be in the train station walking, you know, a quarter mile to go to restaurants, which may make them not go to those restaurants. So we're really um, hesitant about closing down parking. We have the municipal lot on Reef Road. We have out of the train station, which is pretty close to everything, then the over the, the north side. So we're hesitant about closing down roads or parking spots. Not saying we can't, like when we have farmers markets, sometimes we take up some spots there for safety. Um, a couple spots, but not on a large scale. Uh, with the universities, there's also plans to bus. So not not the people that are going from the public in there, but any students or faculty coming from the universities, they provide busing back and forth. Good point. Okay, Veronica, did you have anything you wanted to add to the conversation? Yeah, I just feel as though the intersection of uh, Uncle Road and Post Road with the library reopening, with the new apartments that are opening up the road, with you know the seniors at Mosswood, uh, not all seniors, but a lot of seniors actually living there, with the new outdoor dining at that corner, with the theater opening, with um, with increased pedestrian traffic, um, the schools, not to mention schools and the children and the bike riders on the sidewalk, something has to be done about that corner. I don't I don't think there's a person in town who feels comfortable crossing that road um, from Old Post Tavern to Chase Bank. Um, on a sun, on a Saturday afternoon, um, without feeling that as though they're you know potentially going to get hit, it's a dangerous corner. I think everyone can agree it's a dangerous corner. Whether there can be delays in the stoplight, whether you know I know it's a state road and the state you know has to kind of get involved or you know someone has to kind of get involved, but I really I think something needs to be done there. So I just want to go on record by saying you know it's it's been bad through the years, and I think you know looking toward May, June, July, and August. You know, we want people to feel safe on our roads. We want pe people to feel as though, you know, there are sight lines they can see around the corner. They can see someone, you know, hopping off the corner um, with the new restaurants opening at that corner. I just feel as though, you know, we should have some sort of plan. God forbid someone does get hit. We can say at least you know, preemptively we did some things. You can't prevent all accidents, but you can prevent some. So, you know, I think the parking spots that go all the way down the hill, you know, maybe at night we could think about getting rid of some of those parking spots just to kind of open up the road a bit because it does get tight at that corner. You know, maybe we want to think about, you know, increasing the 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 lights, you know, for a couple of seconds so that people don't feel so rushed to get through the intersection without, you know, um, tying up the roads. You know, and could there be a better police presence at night when there's se several events kind of going on where people feel as though, you know, um, they just feel a little bit safer, but you know, that's my two cents. That's what you guys do for a living. So I appreciate everything you're doing. Um, just wanted to try to get out in front of that uh, as I see potentially, you know, a, a bigger problem. Thank you. I, if I could just add, um, w this has been uh, presented before the police commission. Uh, if, if my memory serves me right, at least two other times, um, one from a high school student who actually applied uh, to go before the police commission to change uh, an actual pedestrian uh, a pedestrian phase for that intersection to include uh, pedestrian uh, warning beacons. Um, I am going to ask Bill Hurley to talk more specifically on that because I know that he has been uh, he has been instrumental in trying to uh, apply to the state to have that intersection changed. Um, so, Bill, I'll let you take that. All right, thanks, Chief. Yeah, it's really a balance of trying, you know, balance the traffic, the pedestrians, uh, business access and parking. Um, the that intersection, if we were to do what they call an exclusive pedestrian phase, would probably uh, stop traffic between twenty and thirty seconds each time, or what they call a traffic cycle. 
and there's over 60, probably anywhere between 40 and 60 cycles an hour. And uh, that would really cause excessive delays, not to mention if the turnpike is ever backed up. So the state and even the town to a degree have been a little reluctant in doing an exclusive pedestrian phase. Right now they call it a concurrent ped phase where when the side streets have green is when you're supposed to cross uh, any of the vehicles that are turning, uh, especially turning left or right, uh, they're supposed to yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. But as we, we are aware of, not everybody knows the rules of the, the road. <clears throat> we met with the state last year and they're, impl they're trying to implement, they have not done it yet, but they're trying to implement uh, a new strategy called a, um, a lead pedestrian interval where they would give the pedestrians four or five second head start to be clearly in the crosswalk, be very visible to all mode, you know, all approaches of traffic, and then give the uh, green light to the side streets. So it's kind of like a compromise, but at least it would, uh, it's been known to be safer and it balances out the traffic better. So um, we can, uh, usually we meet with the DOT annually and we could bring this up and see if they've gotten any farther in terms of improving it or if it's even possible to uh, implement this at this intersection. Um, just can you say the name, say of, that the name of that program again? Program again? Uh, it's, um, it's a lead pedestrian interval. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And, uh, and just while on the, tra uh, on the uh, idea of the traffic lights, uh, currently you might have noticed by uh, Bob's there, North and South Benson and Route 1, and then also at the Ruane Street, uh, the state is in the process of uh, upgrading those signals. They will have audio and uh, visual enhancements uh, and ADA ramps associated with that. And I believe both of them also have uh, an exclusive uh, PED phase. Uh, so um, uh, those will definitely be some safety improvements for the vehicles and for pedestrians at those locations. So that's at Uncle and, and Post Road? No, no, that's at Ruane and Post Road and at North and South Benson and Route 1 Post Road. Why not, Uncle? Fact, why is the state involved with that? Is it because the Post Road is a is that yeah. The state? yeah, those are state owned traffic signals and then to the credit of the state and to the, the police and even some active citizens here and town officials about 10 years ago, uh, Fairfield really showed uh, an uh, extreme interest in um, commenting on the state's plans and the state has been very receptive to that. Uh, we also met with them. Uh, uh, on Mill Plain Road and, and Carter Henry and Thorpe Street, that five-legged uh, intersection. And that was one of the first ones that we met the state with. And so it's been a, a pretty uh, positive program, so much now that the state, I think, invites uh, all the municipalities for um, any of the signal improvements that they propose. And just to let you know, un uh, unfortunately, they, for the uh, matter of economics, they'll release maybe 20 or even 40 traffic signals in the whole district. And so uh, the one that's currently being done on um, North and South Benson and then the other one on Ruane, that's part of like, I think it's a 25 or 30 signal improvement project that runs from Greenwich all the way to Madison. And they have like two and a half years to complete it, but there's never any uh, specific uh, um, contract uh, limitation of when they have to do the signal. So they might do that one as, signal number 16 or signal 14. What we've been finding out is they'll do all the polls um, and span uh, uh, mast arms first, then they, or they'll do the footings and then they'll do the mast arms. And they kind of um, systematically uh, do the each uh, signal uh, as it goes along. So it's never like, oh, this one's first and boom, it's done in, in, in two months. It usually spread out about six months and, and phasing, but right now I'd say they're probably somewhere in the half done range, because I just saw the mast arms uh, on um, uh, on Post Road there and uh, Benson. What can be done at that intersection? Uh, 
again, we, we could we could look at right now uh, just the the, the um, a, a trying to educate people. Uh, there are um, signs that explain when you press the button, you know, to wait for the green. Uh, I believe uh, they were implemented uh, relatively recently. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, traffic, uh, 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 in terms of traffic timing and all that, that's all based on volumes that the state has. We actually have to petition. If it's a minor tweak, we might be able to have the state uh, um, be able to tweak a couple of seconds here or there, but anything major has to actually go to what they call OSTA, the Office of State Traffic Admi uh, Administration, and they hold public hearings and they have to, and usually DOT does like a year study to, before they even do something like that. Unfortunately, they do take it very seriously, and the worst thing they want to do is to um, change a, a signal and then end up with a side effect that they weren't accounting uh, on. Um, and again, just from experience, uh, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned that Mill Plain Road one, uh, we have met with the state two or three times, and we finally, after uh, those meetings, finally were able to convince the state to give the town and Mill Plain Road up to 10 extra seconds of green time on Mill Plain Road. But only, this was the agreement, they, it was not to be done during rush hour. The state was very confident and very uh, determined to keep the Route 1 green time the same during uh, the, the rush hours. So um, the town tried on that one, but unfortunately, the volumes and the uh, state protocol took over. I think, Veronica, also are you saying, and I'm agreeing with you, is that wait for the green on the button may, may, not, may or may not be enough. Will Diaz and I were regulars at Yoga for Everybody for many years. And walking out of there in a Zen state, I might not have seen wait for the green. Um, is there any way you said a small tweak like better signage in that intersection? There are many bikes, pedestrians, and um, cars that are taking that right onto Post Road from Uncoa, and we're all very concerned. So I guess for now, we could just say we've discussed it as much as we can, unless there's someone else that would like to add to that. I, I just want to. I think um, the bicycle riders, what you talked about earlier, the bicycle riders being allowed to use the sidewalk, uh, students after school downtown flying through the intersection on their bike and legally being allowed to do so. Maybe we educate them or, or don't allow it. Maybe we don't allow them to ride bikes through the intersection from sidewalk to sidewalk. I think that's also potentially disaster. I mean, anything and anything we can do, I think just helps. Helps the drivers and helps the safety of the walkers and riders. And I am I would love to get four at five o'clock or, you know, five o'clock to 10 p.m. at night, those spots in front of those buildings as you go down the hill past the police class, the train station to the post road, maybe get rid of a couple of them and only allow them to be daytime parking. If it's, if it's six spots, it opens up the sight line for anyone crossing and not everyone crosses legally. And it's, you know, it's, you know, you're just trying to prevent an accident, any accident. Okay, I know it's already after 12, so I just want, if anyone does have to get off the call, I know Amy did, feel free to, but if anyone can stay on and listen to the last item, number nine, I wanted to briefly go over each of the bullet points in case anyone had additional questions or comments. Uh, Veronica, I know you had a question regarding double lines in front of homes. Is that something you wanted to discuss in today's call? No, is that a plan? Is there a plan to do that down in the beach area? Or is that, is, I mean, I was told that was being considered. Double yellow lines. Want, yeah, is that a plan or not a plan? A lot of realtors I talked to were highly against that. I'm not sure if the Fairfield Police wanted to comment. Yeah, no, I can, I can comment. Uh, that went before the police commission uh, six months ago. Um, and there are some constituents down in the beach area that are looking to prevent double yellow lines. Um, I know from an engineering stand, standpoint, and I won't, I won't speak for Bill Hurley, but I know on several studies, it shows to have a traffic calming effect. There's a narrowing, a narrowing of the roadway when you're looking in the distance. Um, this is uh, an ongoing conversation 
between uh, the police department and the police commission and several of the beach residents down there that have brought forth a petition to have several roads not restriped. Um, the p police commission is looking at it. The police department is doing an analysis of the roadway. Once spring is here, um, they won't paint the lines until the weather is warmer anyway. I think it's about 50 degrees. It has to be a steady 50 degree temperature before they could paint the lines. Um, engineering has suggested that we possibly do a, uh, a two part study or a comparative study, one without the lines and then put down a temporary uh, surface uh, double yellow lines to maybe do a comparative analysis and then have the police commission uh, take a look at that and make it a more informed decision. Um, and, and and that is currently the uh, that is currently the stance that we're we're looking at. Um, I think it's on the agenda for the March 10th police commission uh, meeting to be addressed because it was tabled from last month. And uh, Bill Hurley is going to speak on that uh, during that commission meeting. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to just add one thing, uh, Cap uh, Chief. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, the double lines, uh, double yellow lines, they're also really to designate which side of the road to drive on. And one of the fears is, especially on some of the more narrow roads, um, and you also have to consider uh, people not familiar with the area, um, they may consider a street uh, one way, or they might drive on, it, it sounds strange, but on the wrong side of the road. So there's other safety issues involved. We don't just, or uh, the... Um, the uh, federal government and the state government and, and, and the police departments, uh, the yellow lines are there for, for many reasons, not just uh, the speed uh, control. They're there to legally define uh, which side of the road to drive on. And um, the if I uh, if you give me 30, not even about three seconds here. This is, uh, this is the uh, booklet that you use. <laughs> it's a federal uh, legal document that uh, the towns uh, and the states have to go by. Uh, it's called the MUTCD manual. And it, it, there's definitely uh, certain criteria in there that says if you have a certain volume or a certain width of road, you have to have yellow lines. Then there's others where they say you have to perform an engineering study to determine if you don't put lines. And so there's all sorts of uh, criteria in there that uh, the police and the engineering department go by. Um, and it's not just it's not just for a speed uh, situation, uh, and it's the same thing. It also goes the same thing with the white shoulder lines, whether they have a bike lane or uh, a safe area. As someone mentioned uh, Fairfield Beach Road. At one point, the town was going to put in white uh, lines on Fairfield Beach Road, and it met some opposition. Uh, I think since then they've put them on, but I'll be honest with you, I don't I don't remember the current status of that. So hey, at uh, least we know the commission meeting will meet on March 10th, mm -hmm. as Chief Calamars mentioned. So we'll all stay tuned for that. I'm going to move on so that we can yeah. end the meeting at 1215 if possible. Uh, I know Laura had some questions on the Livingston Wilson Street intersection. Laura? You were echoing before, so just one form of audio, please. I'm trying, I'm trying to do You're still in a cave. Using my using my own. Let me see. Is this any, is this better? any better? Yes, not really. <laughs> okay, I moved to the Stratfield area, uh, Buena Vista. <sighs> really You're okay. Anyway, I noticed li living here, then I go to Livingston Street and I make a left or right onto Wilson, is a blind man's. Is a curve and it's very hard, dangerous. You can't see the cars coming. Is it a possibility to get a stop sign there? If, so I'll answer that. Um, anytime we do a, uh, we look at a proposed stop sign, pull out a request uh, to be seen before the police commission. We receive that request. We do not only a roadway analysis, but we also work with engineering to see uh, if it in fact fulfills the warrants in the MUTCD as Bill Hurley just uh, indicated. Um, so what we could do is we could send you a, a survey request form and uh, you could complete that. One of the components of the survey request form is that you get the neighbors 
and the stakeholders in your neighborhood to agree that that is what they are looking for. So, um, and it explains everything. So maybe if you can email Cindy your, uh, I mean, ch chat Cindy your email and she can forward it to us and we will send you a survey request. Perfect, that's excellent. All right, and then I want to move on. Uncle and Post Road Intersection, we've already discussed, but Bill, did you have any last minute um, items on Fairfield Beach area? I think you gentlemen know the issues on Fairfield Beach Road and Reef and your presence has been, has had a huge positive impact. So thank you for that. And, you know, we're fortunate to have such a well engaged um, police department here in town. Um, the residents over at South Benson, as you know, um, and you, some of you may be aware are, you know, continually dissatisfied with the those drivers who completely blow by that stop sign at Riverside. Um, and I don't think there's any easy solution. We've gone down the road of, of speed humps and tables, and that's not a viable option. Um, a couple of years, I brought to the attention of Chief Liddy, and I think even Chief McNamara when he was around. Some of these images that are painted in the road that have the optical impact or illusion of being elevated surfaces, and is there, you know, any value with those interventions? I think at the time they were not approved by the NHTSA. Um, and I've seen in other towns like Strobes that seem to be quite effective. And, you know, you gentlemen have mentioned before how the speed signs work, but only for a couple of weeks. Any thoughts on any other interventions like images being painted in the roads or, you know, Strobes in being permanently installed to help solve the problems there? Bill, you want to touch on that one? If not, I can. Um, so two, two parts of that. Um, one is cost and maintenance. So um, that is, uh, in particular to South Benson Road, it is uh, very highly traveled in the summer and not so much traveled in the winter. So um, some applications that you might put on that roadway would uh, be uh, justified during the summer, but not necessarily justified during the winter. I could also say that in order to put a stop sign in a certain area, there are certain warrants that have to be um, that have to be fulfilled within the MUTCD. Um, and just as I was explaining, those warrants might be fulfilled in the summer months on South Benton Road, but probably not necessarily justified in the winter months. Um, Bill, do you have anything additionally on the? Uh, yeah, as far, as far as I know, like the 3D image or, or make it look like, I still believe they've not been accepted by uh, any um, uh, municipality in terms of, uh, or I'm sorry, the state or the federal government. They're not listed in the MUTCD manual. Uh, there is a new one going to be coming out probably in about a year or so. Uh, I could, could look to see if they're even looking at something like that. Uh, so I could give you an update on that. Uh, but before we go, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things because nobody has mentioned it. The Fairfield um, has a bike and pedestrian committee. I don't know if anyone's aware of that group. Keith Gallinelli heads that group. They meet monthly uh, 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 representatives from uh, health department, engineering and um, police department also attend. Uh, that's a good group. If you have uh, you want to you know do a little grassroots campaign. Um, the uh, Livingston Wilson Street, we have a whole neighborhood, uh, and I think there's at least two or if not three members of the bike and ped committee that live uh, in that stretch of neighborhood. The other thing I wanted to mention um, is it just so happens to be when you ask what you can do, the RTM members, um, before the Board of Finance, and then it will eventually hopefully uh, go to the uh, uh, RTM, uh, engineering is listing uh, $250,000 for construction improvements of uh, uh, in terms of road safety improvements and that would also implement a traffic signal management plan uh there's uh um there's all sorts of um i don't have enough time to describe it but it, it's coming your way and and certainly uh it was listed in the 14 points at the board of selectmen meeting and we'll and we'll continue on i just wanted to give you a heads up on that perfect bill i'm glad you brought that up um, Veronica had the last few bullet points on the list, so I'm not sure if the survey that Chief Palomars discussed is, is probably pertinent to these, but if you wanted to, Veronica, just summarize your issues with the Post Road, Mill Plain Road intersection, as well as Old Post Road with Post Road, and Bronson Road near Sturges and North Pine Creek as it meets Stur Sturges, turning on to, uh, I don't know if you wanted to discuss that further through the survey that the Chief mentioned, or discuss anything as final comments. I'll do it that way. 
That's easier. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That makes most sense. I really appreciate all your, your contributions today for the last hour and 15 minutes. It, it means so much to our committee. I speak on behalf of the eight member committee that we really are grateful for the time the PD has given us. And this is an amazing first conversation and we look forward to being a resource to you, not only you being a resource to us. So please take our gratitude with you today and also know that we plan to be in touch with other ideas and attend police commission meetings as they are pertinent to what we are discussing here today. So thanks and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Sorry about the disruption earlier. We had a uh, pretty big incident going on. I hope all is well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.